all for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, so a brief introduction about Ms. Joan. She is a nurse and has been living in South Africa and she's been with palliative care for the last 33 years. She has a special interest in children and recently her interest has improved to the children needing palliative care in humanitarian crisis. Having retired as the CEO of the International Children's Palliative Care Network, she now works as a global ambassador for the ICPCN. Uh, so I'd like to end with this and thank you, Ms. John, for joining us and welcome, hearty welcome to you too. Please take over. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here with you today. I'm sorry I've had a few technical glitches. So I'd also be really grateful when you um, help me with the, with the presentation. Thank you. We have a lot of power outages at the moment. Uh, Ms. John, please give us a moment. We are just uh, sharing the screen. Uh, is the screen visible? Uh, John, you're muted. Ma'am, you are muted. Unmute. There we are. Thank you. Thanks so much. As I say, we have so many power outages at the moment that everything is a little bit uh, unsteady. But thank you so much, everybody. And it's really good to talk to you today about palliative care for children or children in palliative care, because palliative care is palliative care. And the principles of palliative care remain the same, whether it's for adults or children but children are children and children from before birth until adolescence, they change and grow and develop so much and so differently that when we apply the palliative care principles in children, we have to adapt it to these different changes in children. So next slide, please. So a child in palliative care can be the patient itself, a boy or a girl, that tiny neonate or that teenager, um, but they could also be a sibling who needs support throughout the illness and then after the child's death. We so often see, I know in India and throughout Africa, the child is the caregiver for their parent. And then you have the child of the sick parent. And all of these children have palliative care needs, whether they include clinical care or whether they are psychosocial, spiritual, social, and supportive care. So we see a wide range of children in palliative care. Next slide, please. And I think this is one of the wisest lessons I've ever learned. Sister Frances Dominica founded, and she was an absolute pioneer in the field. She founded Helen House, the first children's hospice house in the world in 1982. And she said, we, the professionals, are the pupils. The child and the family are the teachers. And it is a masterclass. So we need to remember, we can learn so much from books but we learn most of all from our children and the families that we care for. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to look today at what is palliative care, a few definitions, what makes it different to adult palliative care, um, and looking at the children who need palliative care. It's a wide range. It's a much bigger group than in adults because there are many conditions where the child will die before they reach adulthood. And so those who care for adults don't see the same conditions. And we're going to look at holistic care. I know you've done that. So we'll look at it more briefly. 
but we'll look at it in the light of the children we care for. Next, please. And so we're going to look at that child from legally in most countries and for UNICEF, it is the age of, well, from naught because palliative care for children can begin before birth when a child is identified in the womb with a life-threatening or life-limiting condition. And when we start by preparing the family, supporting them, helping them at the time of, of the birth to make memories or to begin to plan for caring for a child with an illness, with disabilities. But a child is also someone's son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter. It's a, a being that is growing and developing. I have a two-month-old um, grandson. I was there for the first month of his, of his life. They live far away. But every day when they call me and show him to me, there's a change. And so we know that these children grow, they develop, and we have to adapt our palliative care as that child grows and develops. But they're also becoming, they're becoming their own special person. And each will have a different personality and different needs. But we always have to remember that a child is vulnerable. And if we look at the um, UN Charter on the, on the care of the child, we know that children's vulnerabilities mean that they have to be protected by adults, they have to be protected by law, and we always have to remember that in every situation regarding a child, the best interest of the child is always our first concern. And so while we might think that the parents always have authority over that child, actually, it might be that in the best interest of the child, it might be a court who makes decisions. And while that is very hard, it's always in the best interest of the child. Next, please. So let's look at a few definitions about what is pediatric palliative care, children's palliative care, palliative care for children. They all mean exactly the same thing. And it really is a matter of choice. Um, pediatric palliative care is usually used in the medical field. We like children's palliative care because it's palliative care about children um, and it can be palliative care for children. So if you see any of these terms, they mean exactly the same thing. Next slide, please. So we remember that the essence of palliative care for any age group is the relief of serious health-related suffering and the improvement of quality of life. And so when we do these interventions, these are in response to the suffering of the child in the family, that holistic suffering, the suffering of the body, mind and spirit, rather than to the disease itself. The disease itself usually has a, a clinical care plan. These are the medications we use. These are the therapies. But we look at how is the child suffering? In their body, how do we adapt their pain management, remembering the multimodal and the, the comprehensive approach to pain control? And we look at what is their suffering of the mind, the bereavement, the loss, all that they're suffering there. And of course, because every child, just like us, is a spiritual being and is a spiritual being from birth, um, we have to respond to that suffering as well. Next plan, please. So WHO, in fact, WHO for 20 years has recognized that children are different to adults and they've had a, a different definition of palliative care for children. And so I'm not going to read the whole thing because you can find it uh, or you have a copy of these slides, but it talks about the total care of the child and beautifully, even before they put spiritual care into the adult definition, they said a child has a body, mind, and spirit. And it also involves the family. So we know that with a child, we can't care for that child without caring for the family as well. And often the suffering of the family is greater than that of the child. And so we have to see to all of those child's needs as they develop, and then also to remember their special needs at end of life, 
and the bereavement needs of children as well. Next slide, please. And so we look here that Together for Short Live is pretty much the same. It talks about active and total. So it is something where we do something, we don't just say, oh, this poor child, we actually approach them in an active way. And it focuses on quality of life, support for the family, and through death into bereavement. And it also says it can be given alongside potentially curative treatment. So while we are treating a child with radiotherapy, um, uh, any kind of, of medical therapy, surgery, or even antiretroviral therapy, um, and we're looking for a cure, we can still give the support of palliative care. And often palliative care in children is given over many, many years. And so you have a child with, say, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, where palliative care begins its interventions at a young age, but actually into their 30s, that young person can still be receiving palliative care. Next slide, please. But I think for me, the best one, the easiest to remember, which encompasses everything, comes from a child who was born into a family where the previous three siblings had all had this unusual, this rare um, degenerative condition. Two of the children had already died. And when Matty was very young, his, uh, his brother also died, Jamie died. And he lived till he was 12, but he was an incredibly wise old soul, as Elizabeth Kubler-Ross used to say, in that he started writing poetry when he was three years old. And he had a deep insight into um, the suffering of the world. And he said, palliative care for children no longer means helping children to die well. It means helping children to live well. And we need to remember that. We're about helping the, the, the living. Um, and then of course, when the time is certain to help them to die gently. And I think that's probably a motto for our lives, to live well, and to die gently. I think that's something we would all like. So next slide, please. And we always provide it within a children's rights framework. And that fr framework comes from global level, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, to national level, to your own laws and policies that are in India, to even regional level or inside your program, you should have a pro you should have a policy around the rights of the child. And that's why there's always in every country protective legislation for children. Next slide, please. And we need to remember if we say that palliative care is a child's right, is a human right, that even children in humanitarian crises have the same right to palliative care as every other child. And if we think it can be difficult to provide pediatric palliative care in a stable condition, it is so much harder when a child is caught up in a natural disaster like a flood or an earthquake, as recently as happened in Afghanistan. And of course, in a situation of war and conflict, and this is what we're seeing in Ukraine, um, where so many, many children were receiving palliative care. They had 600 home care teams in Ukraine, and so many have been um, affected by this war. Next slide, please. And so if you doubt that um, there are children in humanitarian crises, these are recent numbers. In December, it was 274 million in need of humanitarian aid, of which 75% were women and children. Now it's 303, and that is because of the invasion of Ukraine and what is happening in that tragic country. And so one in every 33 persons worldwide is in a humanitarian crisis. That's huge, and 86%. 98% of children are in low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. 
And again, 100 million people have been forcibly displaced, um, which is huge. Again, most of them in low and middle income countries. So when we are giving palliative care, how do we, how do we integrate a sustainability when some kind of, of humanitarian crisis occurs? And of course it has. We've, we've have, we have COVID, we've had that terrible time of crisis, you've had floods, um, and we have, uh, we went through the AIDS pandemic, and we see natural disasters, war and conflict around the world. So if we're giving palliative care for children, it's got to reach those children. Next slide, please. Okay. And so if we're going to work with children, what we've got to understand is how children grow and develop. And to remember that the biological age is not always the same as developmental age. And what we do find is that many children with long-term chronic conditions, frequent hospitalizations, a lot of interaction with healthcare professionals, with the adult world, often mature um, emotionally and mentally um, more than other children. But of course, a lack of education, a lack of interaction with children can, on the other hand, lead to delayed development. So when we work with these children, we look at the age, sure, three-year-old, but we also look at the developmental stage of the child. Of course, the culture, the culture that the child is born in, the family culture, the family, the, the culture of the, of the country, but also to remember the children and childhood has their own culture as well. And so how children express their emotions, how they learn and understand, and how their spiritual awareness develops is very much dependent on their developmental stage and this particular culture of childhood and their own culture as well. Next slide, please. And I said to you, the age that we do is from before birth when we start preparing the family for this child to neonates and so many neonates who are born prematurely, who are very small, who are born with congenital conditions, genetic conditions, and of course, um, traumatic injuries due to the birth as well, through to young adults. And while we normally say 18, uh, with many conditions we find because these conditions are rare, because they progress from childhood into adulthood, often these young adults in their 20s and even 30s are cared for within a children's palliative care program. And so to provide palliative care for children, we need to have the education, the education related to children. We need the knowledge, but we need the skills. And also we have to be creative because we're going to adapt that knowledge and those skills to the child, to the child's needs. We need to communicate with children of all ages. And the best thing with working for children is we, we have to know how to play because for a child, play is often their primary way of communicating. And so we have to get down on the floor. We have to get down to that child's level and know how to play and how to interpret their play as well. And of course, I always say that when you work with children, because they are learning new things all the time, we have to get into that sense of wonder that children have. Next slide, please. And we, sorry, could we just go back? Um, we need a connected team approach. So every child is my child is a, um, is a proverb we, had, we say in Africa, but actually it's, that child is also everyone else's on the team as well. And so here we have the pharmacist who's connecting and you can see a wonderful connection with this particular child. And so it's not, it's not my child because I happen to be the team nurse, it's every child on the team who each gives their own particular skill and expertise into the care of this child. Next slide, please. So what makes children's palliative care different? So the, the, the principles remain the same, but children differ. And so there is a changing pathophysiology of illness in children, 
the way that that illness presents in a child may be different to that in adults. As I've said, there are unique diagnoses, some that we never ever see in adults. And so we have a much wider range of conditions in children than in adult palliative care. Um, and sadly, if it is a genetic condition, as I spoke to you about Matty Stepanek, that condition may be seen in more than one child in that family. And you can imagine the support that is needed for the family when they have child after child affected with the same condition and child after child who may be dying from that condition. And then of course, we have the, the rare diseases. Some don't even have names because they are so rare. And as I've said, there may be more than one in the family and it might be a condition that is passed down the family um, through generations as well. And so this is, this is all the things that make it more complex than adult palliative care. Also the understanding that a child has of illness and of approaching death and dying is different. Next slide, please. There are unclear prognoses. So we have children, I have, we have a child in our children's hospice at the moment. I went overseas to my family for two months. I've been back a month. Uh, a month before I left, this little one came in again with a very rare condition. And we were told two weeks maximum. Well, uh, that child is still not thriving, but still surviving. So the prognoses are often unpredictable. Um, the impact that it has of a child who has a life-threatening condition um, is great on families and from society as well. Then, of course, as I've said to you, the way we communicate, the way you're going to talk to their parents about what is wrong with them, the way you're going to talk to the child, and we'll mention briefly later, um, how, you, how you use honesty, but honesty in a child's language that they can understand and the way that they um, can process it. And then of course, how do we deal with the bereavement needs of children and families? Next slide, please. Um, we've talked about the, the different diagnoses here. And this is a picture of Juan. He's got Pompey's disease. And the paper he is holding is a list of the side effects of the medication that he is using. So often the development is delayed. So Joan is bright as a button. He's very active. He loves sport, although he can't take part in many of the sports he would love to. Um, but he is very, very small for his age. And this is what we often see. So their reactions to medications may be different as well. And working out the doses and the doses that have to change as they grow and develop is something we have to be on our toes about. So next slide, please. And these are just uh, different types of conditions and the percentages that we see. And as you can see, neurological conditions are way up there and very high and HIV and these are global. These are, these are global and they might differ and they do differ in different countries. So certainly in South Africa, HIV is huge um, and then neurological. But as you can see, cancer, which we often think about is not one of the, the top conditions that we see in palliative care. Although of course, it is the one that we, we're often most aware of. Next slide, please. And so we have different categories of conditions in, in children's palliative care. So first of all, we have, as I spoke about earlier, we have those conditions where they could be cured. So they, mainly we think of certain types of, of cancer, of organ failure that can be reversed. Um, but it's important that right from the beginning, they have access to palliative care services to help them during with their pain, their symptoms, um, when there is a suspicion that this child is not going to survive in the long term. And so we need to look at palliative care from the beginning, even if there is a chance of cure. Next slide, please. Those conditions where we know that they are going to die before they reach old age. 
So they might have long periods of intensive treatment, looking at prolonging their life. And it also depends on the health service in the country. So certainly these young people with cystic fibrosis, with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, are living much longer in countries that have um, a, better, a, high, a higher level of income in the United Kingdom, um, in, uh, in the US and Canada, places like this, they're often living much longer than what we are seeing here in Africa. Next slide, please. Um, those where the children tend, even with curative, even with um, treatment for the condition, these children tend to, to, to um, not survive very long or to only live uh, into, in their childhood years. So the treatment is always palliative. Right from the beginning, we will begin with palliative care. Next slide, please. And then we've got other conditions, which if they receive good care, these children can actually live till a healthy adulthood, like uh, traumatic injuries, severe cerebral palsy, but because of their condition, they're often very much more vulnerable to picking up infections and to an earlier death. So we also give palliative care, of course, with severe cerebral palsy. Uh, multiple disabilities, traumatic injuries, all of these things. And their, con their condition is often such that they need, um, they need really long-term care. And often we as palliative care uh, programs don't have the capacity to care for these children um, over 20, 30 years. Next slide, please. So globally, more than 21 million children would benefit from palliative care. But this is quite an old research that we did with, with UNICEF. Um, and so it's time we did more research. We need to look at every country and see how many children basically would need palliative care. But 98% of these children are in low and middle income countries and only about 5% are receiving it. So we're failing these kids hopelessly. Um, and it depends where you are. So if you're living in, in the UK, your chances of getting palliative care are going to be much better than if you're living in Tanzania. Um, so we need to look at it country by country and region by region. Next slide, please. Um, and then of course, in conflict areas, the mortality in, of children increases. So we've seen a high mortality of children in Ukraine who've been killed and in conflict um, situations. And in fact, even in acute um, natural disasters like earthquakes, like floods, there's an increase in premature births. So there is an increased need for neonatal palliative care. And yet often the resources that are needed are limited or they have been destroyed through war and conflict. Next slide, please. We need to remember that communication with children changes as they develop. So with that tiny little baby, and this is Seho, one of our um, carers at Sunflower House, and you can just see the communication, can't you? The way we communicate is through looks, through cuddles, through the way we talk to them, through the way we handle them. Um, but that child who's five or six, you're going to have a much better conversation with and the child of 10, 11, 12, or the teenager that you can have an adult conversation with. So our communication skills, you could decide you're going to communicate, you're going to just work with those little babies or with young children. But if you're working in a general uh, children's palliative care program, we're going to have to have communication skills from the newborn baby right up to that adolescent. Next slide, please. And we need to acknowledge the humanity from the beginning. Lucy is an amazing, amazing young woman. She's a real global ambassador for palliative care, but she was investigated for many years for her condition. She was given a wrong diagnosis. And she said all of these doctors that she was sent to, they looked at the system that they specialized in. 
So the neurologist looked at the neurological system. Um, the, the orthopedist looked at, at what was happening to her bone structure. The cardiologist looked at her heart, but she said it was only when she was eventually referred to palliative care that the first time somebody said, who is Lucy? Lucy, tell us about you as a person. And she became, in their eyes, she saw herself as a person and not just this collection of bodily systems and a diagnosis. So we need to remember that as well. And that's where we as volunteers can do so much. Next slide, please. Um, John, I'd like to interrupt for a moment. So do you um, want to pause for a moment and invite questions or would you just want to- Yes, continue? that's absolutely. Um, maybe just let me do this communication one. Okay. Uh, there's two communication slides and then we stop after that sure. because then, sure. then I finish that section. Okay. And we need to remember that the kids are very honest and open in the way that they, that, that they communicate. So you have this letter to God, you know, did you make the giraffe like that or was it an accident? I mean, when we talk to whoever we see as a greater being, do we talk like that? Um, and this other child who says that, I love you, God, because you made us. But why do we have to die? Why do people have to die? And that's a question that we often ask ourselves. So the next slide, and then we can pause. Um, and the magical thinking that a belief that unrelated events are causally connected, despite the lack of logic. So when a child gets sick, when their parents get sick, when their siblings get sick, they wrongly believe, but they do believe that they did something wrong to cause the illness or the death of another person. And we need to remember this. We need to look at what are their beliefs and get them to talk to us. Um, okay, so let's, let's have a break there. And I'm happy to answer questions. So the floor is open for questions. If anybody has any questions, please do feel it's free to unmute your mics and speak up. Or if you have connectivity issues, please do populate the chat box. I'd love to know from, um, from any of you, have you had um, a situation where a child has said something to you that perhaps surprised you by their insight or by the way they were looking at some aspect of illness or, or death or dying? I had my niece uh, uh, recently asked me a question when she uh, she was sick. Uh, is if God knows the future, then why does He not stop bad things from happening? Mm. And and how old is your how old is your niece? Uh, uh, nine year old. You see how how deeply they are thinking because I think that's a question that that we ask. And how did you answer her? Uh, well, I created a PowerPoint presentation to answer her. <laughs> that sounds I, wonderful. Because I, I work in the in the church, but uh, she was lazy that day and she couldn't attend, so I have to show it to her again. So <laughs> I just tried explaining that uh, uh, God has a plan through everything and we mm -hmm. need to wait and see, so that kind of thing. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And that's a hard question. I, you know, I have a lot to do with people in Ukraine at the moment. And you can imagine how often the children there are asking that question. And the adults, of course. It's a hard, it's a hard one. But at nine years old, she was thinking, um, she was thinking, what is really a deep, a deep issue? Anyone else? You know, I have kids come to me and say, what does it mean to be dead? Um, you know, you talk about, about dead, but what does it mean? What happens? How does it happen? Where do we go? So they often ask questions like that.
Any other questions or any other comments? Otherwise, let's go on and there might be some later on. Yes. Um, one more thing, Joan, we do not have a case presentation today, so we can use the whole time for the fact presentation of yours. Oh, okay. Thank you. And we need to remember that children express in many different ways. So if they can't talk to you, they might draw how they're feeling. They might do it through the way that they use music or dance. We often forget about dance. I had a, a teenage patient with a brain tumor and she had been this tiny, slim, beautiful little girl with long hair who loved to dance. And she was, she was with us for five years with this brain tumor. Um, and because she was on high doses of cortisone, she put on a lot of weight. She'd had uh, chemotherapy, so she'd lost her hair. Um, and so this tiny, dainty little girl had become weak because of her muscle weakness, what was happening. She was losing her sight and, um, and she'd put on a lot of weight because of, simply because of cortisone. And we were sitting one day together and some music came on and she stood up and she did this most incredibly sensual dance because by the stage she was 16. And we often, often forget when we're dealing with, with adolescents that the issue of sexuality, um, and when you're a teenager and you can't, you can't put on beautiful clothes and you don't have a boyfriend because of, you know, because of your illness, and it doesn't stop those feelings of sensuality and sexuality that young people have. And we're often much more uncomfortable dealing with that then we are dealing with things like spirituality, but we have to be open to it. And music and dance and poetry is a way for enabling them, especially our adolescents, to express themselves. And we have a very active poetry group um, for our adolescents and some incredibly powerful poems have come out of that. So next slide, please. And when they draw a picture for, to you, for you, don't look at it and interpret it. Ask them why they painted it like that, why they drew it like that, why they used the colors that they did. Um, we had a, a young boy who drew us this picture and it was all in black and gray and you know these dull and we thought, oh my goodness, what's happening inside him? And when we asked him, he said, no, all the other colors were broken. These were the only ones that weren't broken and he didn't like using broken crayons. So it had nothing to do with his internal feelings. It had all to do with the fact that the only crayons that he wanted to work with were the, were the ones that weren't broken and the only ones that weren't broken were the dark colors. So we always need to say, why have you drawn it like that? That's interesting. Won't you tell me what you've drawn? Next slide, please. And this one as well, this was a, a little girl whose granny was dying and she, she was trying to work out that how her granny was going to get to heaven. Um, and so we thought it was an angel. We thought she'd drawn, an, she'd drawn an angel and she said, no. She said, that's my granny going to heaven. And I didn't know how she was going to get there. So she had to have wings. And because she's going to heaven, she's going to become an angel. And so I've given her a halo as well. But um, so ask before you interpret. Next slide, please. And remember that children can draw. So that if somebody asked me to draw a picture, my first reaction was going to be, oh, I can't draw. You know, I can only do a stick figure or something. A child doesn't have that kind of, of feeling inside themselves. Of course they can draw. And this is, how do we forget? How do we forget how to draw? How do we forget how to sing? How do we forget how to freely express ourselves by using our bodies? Um, all the constrictions are getting bigger. So we need to allow that child to express in the way that they feel happiest to do. Next slide, please. And play, as I said at the beginning, play is so important. And a child can show you so much through the way that they play. 
um, and we have to encourage play. And so you'll find that UNICEF, wherever they are, wherever they're working with children who live in, in poverty, children in conflict, children who've been infected, affected by other um, crises, they, they have safe spaces where children can play. And within our programs, we need to have areas where children can play. Or if they can't come into our, into our settings, when we go to their homes, have a look and see, do they have enough play equipment? Do they have enough items for play? And if they don't, um, to me, it's just as important to take those play items to them as it is to take their medicines and our skill and knowledge. Next slide, please. And even Albert Einstein, one of the greatest brains of all time said, play is the highest form of research because we need to remember the children grow and develop and understand and learn to be with other children and to interact and to communicate and to express themselves all through play. Um, so play is a science as much as it is a creative expression. And these three little ones, they were all really quite sick, but if you look at them, and the wall behind them is our wall of remembrance at Sunflower House, where when a child dies, we put their name into a flower so that they know they will never ever be forgotten. Um, but you can just see the way that they're connecting and interacting despite their illnesses. Next slide, please. And even in humanitarian crises where there's death and destruction, this needs to be provided. And I just love this, that this, even in all this destruction, you have this person who realized that children needed to be distracted, needed to smile, um, and who set up to be a clown for them. And what it is, is really providing children with a simple miracle of an ordinary life, the things that they can relate to, even in these dramatic situations. And as you know, in India and in Africa, where we have gross uh, poverty, um, you go into areas and it always amazes me, even when they don't have formal toys, the children will find something to play with. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, and as I said earlier, if you give them a space to be, um, especially outside where they interact with nature, and these three little ones, we were outside in the garden and they'd been talking to each other and they were three and four years old. And they came and said to me, what does it mean to be dead, Sister Jo? Now, how would you answer that one? What does it mean to be dead? Would anyone like to, um, to try? So the possible responses are, first of all, we don't lie. And I always start by saying, I don't know everything because it's not happened to me, but this is what I think. Um, but first of all, you've got to say to them, why do you ask me that? These three little ones were asking it because one of the children in the house had died. Um, but it could be that they found a dead frog. It could be a plant that had died. So ask them, why are you asking me that question? Then you can say to them, what do you think? Because it gives you an idea of how they are thinking inside their mind as well. What do you think? And many times, you know, they'll say, they'll say to you, well, I think we're going somewhere where we're going to be happy. We're going to go to heaven. But how do you get there? Do we have to take an airplane? Do we need a long ladder? Um, so every time you ask them to express themselves, you're giving them a chance to tell you more about what they are thinking as well. What made you ask that question? As I said, with these three, it was because one of their little friends in, in the house had died. But it could just as easily be by their dog has died, um, their grandmother's died. So ask them about that. You can also ask them, what have you been told? You know, parents will often say to you, now you know, you mustn't talk to my child about death and dying because they don't know they're going to die. Um, so what I normally say to the parents is, I won't tell them directly 
But if they ask me a question, I need to answer that question and I need to answer it honestly. And because parents so often think, well, my child doesn't know that they're dying, they agree to it. Um, and I always say to them as well, if they speak to me about it, I will tell you about it as well, because parents need to know so that they know how to approach the child as well. But honesty is absolutely so essential with children. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go into any detail about pain in children, because um, and I know that this is probably a different, you've learned this in clinical. I'll just talk about a few elements, a few principles of pain management in children that you as volunteers as well can be involved in. Um, next slide, please. We remember that it's pain is total. It's physical, it's psychological, it's social, it's cultural, it's spiritual. And children experience suffering on all of these levels as well. And pain that is physical is usually the easiest to deal with because we have the medications. We know how to do the dosages. We know how to titrate medications. We know how to add medications to it as well. And so the pain they feel um, emotionally, socially, spiritually, and culturally is usually much more difficult to deal with than the actual physical pain. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we do is we reverse the reversible. Is it something that can be reversed? Is this a pain that is because they have a fracture according a, a, a due to their illness? Um, can we use non-drug measures? So with children, we use um, play, we use physiotherapy and occupational therapy. And children become very, very easily distracted from their pain. Um, and we can use things like um, hypnosis as well. There's a wonderful procedure called the magic glove, which is quite easy to teach and quite easy to use. And it requires a session on its own. But it is a way of providing um, a pain-free interventions like putting needles in and that kind of thing. But it uses hypnosis and self-hypnosis as well. So we mustn't forget that there's so much that we can do that is non-drug. And to carry with you simple things like a puppet or a, um, a bottle of bubbles that can often distract the child from their pain as well. And then of course the drug measures, which will be um, decided on by the clinician in charge and we have to address all their types of pain and not just the physical pain. And remembering that children often have pain in the mouth, um, babies, little children, and older children, and we forget about that. We think about the pain of the cancer, um, the pain of their condition, and we, we think about giving them morphine, but we don't look inside their mouths to see how we can treat the pain in the mouth. And the very first children's hospice I ever visited was in Warsaw um, in Poland. And the, um, the doctor, very visionary, he was one of the pioneers of palliative care for children. He didn't have a um, inpatient unit. He only believed in home care. But what he had was a dental clinic because he said, these children, they all have dental problems. Nobody looks at it. You know, we're so busy looking at all the other elements, we forget about the toothache, we forget about the thrush, we forget about dealing with, tooth, um, with, with mouth problems. Next um, slide, please. Um, and as you remember, probably we seek the under, what is the cause of this pain? The cause can be constipation in a child. Can we treat that? Of course, you treat that and the cramps stop. We treat everything that can be treated, and we look to see if the medications, and as I showed you earlier, these children respond differently to medications. So we look at maybe a drug that we would normally use in an adolescent isn't really working that well with a seven-year-old. And so we need, to, we need to look at that and change the medications as well. Next slide, please. 
And we can use tools. Now, this is the one I like the best because the child can use it. And if you're volunteers and going into the home, it's a simple tool that you can use with children. It's the Elan body tool. And so what we normally do is we first, the child, even a small child, even a two-year-old we find, can show you where on the body they have the pain. So that gives you an idea. They can show you if it spreads somewhere else. And as they get older and can use, can use colors and crayons, you can ask them to decide which colors is for a little bit of pain, what color would be for a moderate amount, and what would be for the most pain. And you get them to color in as well. So it's something that volunteers can use very easily and can be a very helpful tool um, for the clinical team as well. Next slide, please. It's my favorite one. Uh, the revised faces pay, um, pain scale, but you have to be careful with that because you've got to teach the child how to use it. And so very young children, they will probably, what we find is that, that they like to point to the happy faces. Even if they've got pain that's about an eight or a 10, if you show them and say, which, which face is yours, they'll, they'll point to the happy one. So you, they have to be taught, they've got to be old enough to use this um, pain scale with understanding. Next slide, please. And the older children can use color, they can use a pain diary where they write what the pain was like, how it developed, how long it, um, it continued, what did they use to, to make the pain feel better, which medications worked. So the pain diary is also a good thing to have. Next slide, please. And what is Stefan Friedrichsdorf, if you would like to Google him, you will find he's a real visionary and he's been a pioneer in pain treatment for children. And when he treats a child for pain, he looks at every single aspect. One of his mantras is if this is a school going child and the child has stayed at home because of their illness, if you can get them back to school, that is one of the primary things that can help them to control their pain because it makes them feel normal again and they cope better with their pain as well. So he talks about multimodal analgesia. So using your medication, but then also using things like physiotherapy, like um, vi visualization, like um, non-pharmacological massage and those kind of therapies as well. Next slide, please. And rehabilitation. So he uses a lot of physical therapy, physiotherapy and occupational therapy, um, cognitive behavioral ther therapy with the psychological modalities, and of course, spirituality. Because if you deal with the spiritual suffering, that can often impact on the physical suffering as well. And then things, as I've said to you before, um, breathing, bubble blowing, self-hypnosis, relaxation, biofeedback, massage, all of these things are wonderful. Aromatherapy, acupressure, acupuncture, and virtual reality, if you have the funding to have those specific advisors that they can look into. So next slide, please. So technology, when we're working with children, especially children are tech savvy from a very, very young age, aren't they? They can use that cell phone, they can find their games, they can find their music very quickly. So technology is essential. And if we look at the UN agencies, you will see that all the major UN agencies now have a department looking at the use and the, um, the, the creative use of technology not only UNICEF, but WHO as well, um, and all the major agencies, as I've said, because we recognize the technology is essential in palliative care and in pediatric palliative care. And how much of training and teaching is being done via WhatsApp and Twitter these days. Um, so we need to be able to do that. Next slide, please. And this is just showing you how um, a non-clinical person 
can use the magic eye to show a clinical person miles and miles away in another part of the world what the child looks at, can be asked to direct it to certain parts of the child's body. And through that, the clinician sitting on the other side of the world can say, this is, this is the treatment that I recommend for this child. So all these technologies that we, we can use, we need to use to the best of our ability. And even our simple little uh, mobile phones can do so much. Um, from that up to using things like 3D printers to make artificial limbs. Next slide, please. And something, I don't know if you're seeing it, but we're certainly seeing it here. We so many of the children who come into our children's hospice and have chronic conditions um, and who come from, from areas of deep poverty are actually deliberately using their condition and mismanaging their condition so that they can be readmitted to hospital, readmitted to the hospice, because there they get spoiled. They get bought airtime and data, they get given cell phones, and they get given everything they want because they're sick children and the staff want and the volunteers want to spoil them. And they are manipulating in a way their condition, um, which actually shortens their lives because they want to, to have this more comfortable surrounding as well. Um, and so I'd really be really interested to hear if anybody has experienced that with children that they're seeing. Is there anyone who's, who's seen, who's noticed that in the care that they give? So maybe perhaps we need to look out for it. It would be a very good global um, research project, I think. So next slide, please. And so how are children different at the end of life? Now, I want to say right from the beginning that so often children know that they are dying. They know that they're dying. They want to talk to you about it. And if we put up this barrier, which parents do, and I totally understand it, that I don't want to talk to my child about dying. If we put up that barrier, it stops them talking to you about, about their dying. I've had children have said to me, their mother who died has came to them last night and said, now you're going to come to me. Um, I've had children who've quite directly said to me, I'm going to die very soon. And even though diagnostically, it hasn't looked as though they will, they've been right. I've had a little one who was three, who didn't speak very much, who um, when I went to see him in the children's hospice where he was on oxygen, he pointed out to me that he wanted to go with me in the car. As we were driving, he pointed out places he wanted to visit. He told me the names of people he wanted to see. And when he'd visited all his favorite places and seen all his favorite pe people, he died. So we need to recognize that children know they're dying and they want to explain to you that they are and we need to be open to listening to that conversation, however it's shown, whether it's in drawing, whether it's in words, whether it's as Stembi was showing us what he wanted to do before he died. Um, we need to be open. So next slide, please. Okay. And there's an excellent, excellent study that came out by um, Chong Po Hing, who is a wonderful doctor in Singapore. And this was his PhD study, actually. And he looked at what, was, what, was, um, the com what were the commonalities in what we would say was a good death in a child with a life-shortening illness. And the one was seeing the child letting go. When the child starts maybe giving away their toys, not watching television, not doing the things that they normally got pleasure out of doing. The letting go can also be letting go of people. Um, people that we think, you know, we think we're the volunteer, we've been visiting this child, and the child suddenly doesn't want to see us. And it's really not about us. It's not about us being bad or hopeless at the work that we do. It's about the child 
needing the energy for dying and needing it to concentrate on the people closest to them. And so they let go. They let go of things that they've enjoyed, the people that they've enjoyed being with, to concentrate on dying. It's then acknowledging, as I've said, you're acknowledging the child and what their insight is. It's actually when that child starts talking to you about finding out, are there, are there issues of closure? Are there things they want to do? And these wonderful organizations that help them with uh, make a wish or, you know, they want to go in a helicopter or they want to see the sea or they'd want to have a, a special kind of toy. What do they need to make closure? Is there anyone they need to see? Maybe it's a favorite teacher. Maybe it's a teacher from their faith group. Um, we have wonderful chaplains and often when the child is dying, they'll say to you, please send for Father Lazarus, please send for Father Keith, I need to see them. Um, so what does that child need and what does the family need for closure? It's also letting them to be in, in control. So if they say, I don't want to play with a person, if they say, I don't want to have that teddy bear, let them be in control. If they say, just leave me alone for a little while, um, let them have control. And then, of course, we never, ever take away the miracle of hope. And we always talk about how hope changes and what gives, what gives hope. What are they hoping for? So that's a question we can ask the family. We can ask the child, what are you hoping for? And for the child, of course, in the beginning, what they want is to get better. Um, so hope is, is a huge, huge uh, subject. And um, I don't know whether you handled it in another session, but it certainly is a session that is needed on its own. And remembering the children have different levels of awareness as well of what is going on. So that child who is on a lot of pain medication, that child who's very young, that newborn baby, of course, their awareness levels are going to be different. But we, it's up to us to have that awareness of what they're aware of and what they want to tell us. Um, next slide, please. So we need to have in place the systems and the processes. So when we're looking at it, whether we call it advanced directive, advanced care plan, whatever it is, we need to say, when that child is dying, what system, what people do we need to have who are available? Where do they want to be? Where does the child want to be? Most of them don't want to die in the hospital. They want to be at home, surrounded by family. So do we have the processes in place to allow them to die at home? One little girl we had, she wanted to die outside in the garden. And that was her absolute desire right from the beginning she knew she was dying she was only five she didn't want to die in a, in a cot her family um, had died it was in the time of AIDS she wanted to be in the garden where the playground was where the other children were and while that might be quite hard we were able to allow that and we wanted the child to have as normal a life as possible as long as possible and comfort, you know, that, that comfort, that holding them, because comfort isn't just about pain management. Comfort is also about human presence. Um, and this is one of the best children's chaplains I have ever known. A, a very, very practical an Anglican priest, but who had a special connection to children. And we always used to laugh, because I'd say, Father Keith, when you come and talk about spiritual care for children, in a training course. And he'd look at me and he'd say, but Joan, then I need five minutes. He said, because all I'm going to say to them is presence. You need to be a constant caring presence for that child, loving presence. And he said, that's it. That's the, the beginning and end of spiritual care of children. So I think remember that sometimes when we think we have to bring in all these fancy techniques, often what that child needs is just knowing they're loved and cared for. 
Next slide, please. And our advanced care plan, you've probably done this anyway, so I'm not going to go to in that in detail. We've spoken a bit about it. Um, and so the child's wishes, who do they want with them? Who are the key role players? What is needed for them to be comfortable? And what resources are available in the family? And what resources do we perhaps need to provide? Next slide, please. Look at the bigger picture. Um, and of course, cultural and religious issues are very important. Look at who makes decisions. As I've said to you before, we often think the parents are the major decision makers, but we know that in some complex cases, actually the courts have made decisions. Um, the ethical issues, uh, and that I'm sure is another course that you've done. And then what can that child, that child is just like us. We want to be remembered. And that's why we, drew, we, we actually painted the, the sunflower wall on our children's hospice house. Um, because these children were saying, but nobody will remember me, often from families who died out, families who maybe rejected them because of their illness, couldn't cope. And just a simple matter of saying, your name will be in that flower. And as long as the wall stands, your name will be, you will be remembered. They might want to draw pictures. They might want to leave letters. They might want to give items away. So again, if you have a good um, relationship, you're going to be able to care for them. Next slide, please. Communication, we've spoken about that as well. So um, again, gentle honesty, I think is the most important thing. Next slide, please. And death, the preparation of the family. What are the rituals that are needed at the time of dying, at the death? after the death, and that varies from culture to culture. Next slide, please. Bereavement support, and I'm sure you have a talk on that, so I'm not going to talk much about that. But next slide, please. But just to remember that bereavement is ongoing from the time of the illness begins. And I think this explains that this is a a bereaved child in Ukraine, he has, and he said, and I think this is powerful, I have died. So part of him has died, two dogs, my grandmother, and the beautiful city of Mariupol. And so he not only wrote it, he drew it as well. So all these multiple losses that a child goes through, we need to deal with. Next slide, please. And actually the biggest thing that we can do is when they are faced with this overwhelming power and impact of loss is accompanying them. There must be a caring, constant adult who accompanies them. And sometimes it's that volunteer who goes in, who goes in regularly is the person that they can depend on to be there, to just be that presence. Next slide, please. The spiritual assessment, and we've, you know, there is a separate um, presentation on that. So again, but remember, even a child, a small child has a meaning, looks for meaning, looks for a purpose. Meaning might be just being loved. His purpose might be to get up and play or to go to school and see their friends. They need, they, they, they need to be connected to nature, to others, to themselves, um, to something bigger than they are. And children are very open to mystery and paradox. As I've said to you, why do people have to die? Why did the giraffe make like that? Was it, was it a mistake that he had that long neck? Um, and at the middle of this, in spiritual care, is always keeping that hope. And the hope might be to a better life after death. It might be to a gentle dying. It might be the hope to be remembered. Next slide, please. Um, and the, the, really this global consensus definition, if you're looking to do spiritual care, take this definition and it will show you, connect children to each other, to the family, to the community, to nature, um, to something bigger than they are, just could be the sky at night or the stars out there. Um, and so spiritual care of children is very practical. 
that if you want a very practical definition that you can really apply, this consensus definition to me is outstanding. Next slide, please. Um, and, you know, spiritual assessment and care, it's part of holistic care, it's in the WHO definition. And so we need to feel comfortable with spirituality as well as dealing with emotional care, with social care, play, and with clinical features. Next slide, please. There are lots of resources that we can look at. Um, there's a lot of resources um, in India itself. There's some excellent publications that I've seen. Next slide, please. And we know that there is a benefit to palliative care for children. So next, please. So why do we allow the situation of only 5% of children who need it getting it? So we all have to become advocates for children's palliative care because we are responsible for children. Next slide, please. And so we need to be advocates where we can. It might be we have contacts at policy level. It might simply be um, to see that there are pediatric formulations in the pharmacy and not just big medicines that have to be crushed or broken for children but they, we can all be advocates for these children because remember they cannot be advocates for themselves because of the role they play, their vulnerability, their, their age, their inability to use the right words. So we need to be those advocates. Next slide, please. And when we work with children, you don't have to do anything fancy. Dr. Liz Molino started a beautiful program in Malawi which is the world's poorest country, according to the World Bank. And she said, do things simply and do them well. So get those few skills, if it's in, even if it's a skill in using a puppet and playing with bubbles, in, in helping children to draw and express themselves, develop your skills and do them simply and do them well. Next slide, please. And remember this, which I think is so important, what we want for every child, whether they have a serious illness, whether they're living in poverty, whether they are caught up in um, unrest or in war, what we have to do is provide the quiet miracle of a normal life. And normality for that child might be different to what we think is normal, but find what kind of normality we can give that child to be a child because that's the most important thing, to allow the child to be a child despite their illness. Next slide, please. So thank you. And um, I'm very willing to answer any questions that you may have. Please do take this opportunity to ask questions of uh, any, any type of confusions you have uh, related to children and palliative care, because it's often a very tough topic and a very complex situation when dealing with children. Um, and if you have had any personal experiences to share with us, please do that too. I think uh, there was a movie called uh, Life is Beautiful, uh, a 1977 Italian film where the father shields the child uh, from the trauma of war uh, by, you know, uh, mm -hmm. using his creativity and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, and it was, it was really a beautiful film, a commercial and a critical success as well. So, yes, it, uh, yeah. How do you reconcile that with the ethic of being truthful to a kid? Uh, you know, because as it is, the 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 sickness itself is so uh, uh, shattering to a kid's uh, world, mm -hmm. and then uh, to not being able to uh, give him any hope about the future. Uh, also, that I do not know what is about uh, what is going to happen once you die. <laughs> How do you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that, that film was extremely powerful. And I think in that situation where it was about the safety, keeping the child alive, um, 
So deceiving him by making everything a game. It was all a game. Everything was play. Um, and for those who haven't seen that movie, I really will I would suggest that you that you do watch it. Um, but you know, it's keeping the hope alive with children. First of all, when it is a serious illness, we have to realize that children know what's happening to them. They know that they can't play as much as they played in, in the past. They know their changes. And they're actually quite accepting. Little children are much more accepting of what is happening than your older child and your adolescent. Mm. And so we have to help them to change their focus of hope. You know, if a child says to me, or an adult even, I want to get better. My answer is always going to be, that's what I wish for you as well. Um, but if that doesn't happen, what else would you like? And we can do this with children. What would you hope for? And it might be, well, I really want to go to that dance next month. And so with that hope, you can start, well, what would you like to wear? What kind of music do you think you'd like to listen to? And there's sometimes there are things you can do. A girl I told you about who danced. Um, her, her class was absolutely amazing mm -hmm. until she literally was totally bedridden. They made sure she went to every dance in a wheelchair. A whole group of them would come, put on her makeup, put on a pretty wig, make sure she was nicely dressed. And then they would tell all the young men there, you have to dance with Susan. <laughs> and, and the young men did as well. So it's a matter of, of going with their emotions, saying, yes, of course, that is what I wish for you. And, and I will pray for it if that's what you want. Um, but let's see what we can do with what the situation is now. And as I say, the younger, the younger children are easier to deal with because a young child is, is seeing changes all the time. Um, but your older children, your teenagers, those are the ones that that are really that really suffer emotionally and spiritually. Correct, correct. Thank mm. you. Thank you so much. I really find with children, it's just if you're a caring presence, if you're prepared to get into their world, um, to sit and play with them, that they open up very easily. I had one family with four children, four boys. And the, the father was dying and they asked me, would I go and speak to the children? So I said to them, they were aged from six to 16. What do the children know? Oh no, they don't know anything. They just know that daddy's been sick. You know, and by the time we'd sat and talked and with the younger children played, all of them knew that their father was very sick and was going to die. But the mother and father were totally convinced that the children knew nothing. Um, but if you're there and you show that you're open to them, that they can tell you anything, that you're unshockable, you know, so with your teenagers who wants to talk about sex, that you can be totally unshockable, um, then they will talk to you. And only then can you really accompany them. Thank you for your response. Hmm. I had uh, one more clarification to ask, if I may. Yes. <laughs> uh, you you mentioned about uh, children being spoiled uh, in the hospital. So <laughs> how do you deal with that area of when, uh, <laughs> getting back? Uh, yeah. about it. yeah. It's uh, we don't, and that's the problem. I think okay. <laughs> it's because these children come, and because they they have chronic conditions, and you've seen them from maybe a two or three-year-old, another a 10-year-old, and they're part of your life, but you know that their life is going to be shortened. So what we do, we try and, of course, we try and do counseling with them and, you know, build up family relationships and see if we can't help the family with resources. But it's something we've only recently really become aware of. Um, and we're finding it's really difficult to deal with because they go into the ward and there's a new nurse there and she falls in love with them. And, and of course, if that's what you want, that's what I'm going to go and do for you. Yeah. Um, so it's trying to get them to understand that if they keep on manipulating what's happening to them, 
they're affecting their illness and their body and they're making themselves weaker. But we haven't had much success so far. So that's why I'm, I want to do a little bit more research into that particular element because people don't, co don't collaborate. You know, they, they say, oh, yes, that's really serious. And the next thing you go there and she's got a new cell phone. Um, and who gave that to you? Oh, Dr. Young gave it to me. And I go to Dr. Young and say, didn't we discuss this? Oh, but, you know, she really needed it to communicate. <laughs> so, so, yes, that's a challenge. <laughs> Thank you. And maybe just to say that, that I have worked in India a lot. Um, I was involved in a five-year program to develop children's palliative care, working from um, Tata Memorial Hospital in, in uh, Mumbai. But, but working in various places. So um, I've visited and worked in India many times over the past, gosh, 12 years. Yeah. Right. So I'm aware of the situation and much of it is like in, in um, Africa as well. Jeez. We have a lot of similar challenges. Right, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, if there are no more questions from your side, maybe, okay, that's um, Abhishek, do, do you have another question? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you have the time. <laughs> Please go. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, if uh, uh, the spiritual dimension is so important uh, for kids who are dying, I mean, for any anybody, really. Mm -hmm. But there's a great uh, uh, lack of it, uh, awareness of it, or, or it's not, not being given, mm. given priority. I think since you mentioned about the Tata Hospital, we, uh, the, we have a uh, cancer research institute here, Tata Cancer, mm. Argar, where I'm staying. So yes. they, they don't have any palliative uh, department, and uh, they don't even have any spiritual uh, uh, department of, of some providing some comfort. Mm. They have no facility. So it's quite uh, challenging in such countries. So how do you, uh, I mean, how do you really provide care uh, in third world countries or in water? How do you actually get down to that? It's, 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 it's impossible. I mean, it's just next to impossible. Maybe. How do you um, navigate well, spir spiritual, care, spiritual care is actually it's something that we can all do. Because if we understand that spirituality and religion, we often express our spirituality through our religion, through our religious practices and rituals and things like that. But actually spirituality is much bigger. It's the way we connect with something greater than we are, the way we connect with nature, the way we connect with other people. And it's about what gives us meaning and purpose. So when we're working with these children, and older children, it's quite, you can have the conversation, you can talk to them about, you know, what, what is the most meaningful thing in your life? And it's often, it's the interaction with peers. Um, or what is it, what do you hope for? You know, what is, what is your purpose in life? If I asked all of you, what is your purpose in life? Some of you could say it's to be the best person that I can be. It's to be the best mother or father or grandmother or grandfather that I can possibly be. It might be it's that, you know, that I want to, my purpose in life is to train as a, as a, um, as a chaplain and to go and be a, to be a chaplain. So we all have different purposes in our lives and what gives meaning. But when we're working with children, it's helping them to connect because when you're a sick child, especially a chronically ill person, there's so many disconnections. You spend a lot of time in bed and you spend a lot of time in hospital. So immediately you're disconnected from normality of life. And that's why Stefan Friedrichsdorf always says, they can go to school, get them back to school. How do we see to that? And that's a spiritual, it sounds crazy, but that's a spiritual dimension because it's allowing them as a person to connect with other people who have meaning in their life as well. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing with spirituality is nature. They disconnect from nature because they're in bed, they're in hospital. How do we bring nature to them when we can't take them to nature? 
that again is a spiritual dimension. Um, the other is, is the, the interaction with something greater than they are. And that's often where our religious beliefs and you know, respecting everybody's religious beliefs and how do you connect them to what can give them faith in the future. Um, but it could be something, what I often do is I take them outside at night and show them the stars. You know, because that's something that they can say, we can see this is bigger than us. I can't see God, however you, you um, express God or, or the, the creator, but I can see that I'm part of a world that's much bigger than I am. So we can, do, we can all do some form of spiritual care. And the way we connect with that child, as I've said, and when we do spiritual care, don't automatically think that your religious leader is going to be good with children because a lot of them are very good religious leaders. They're very good talking to adults. They're very good working with adults, but there's only a small proportion that have that connection with children. Um, and we're very, very short of, of children's, whether you call it a chaplain or a spiritual um, provider. Um, but spiritual care is actually not difficult. If you go and look up that definition and look at how it shows you. We take the kids outside, we let them play with other children. We bring people in to see them. We show them the stars. We show them um, that they have meaning, that their life, even though they have this illness, their life still has meaning. We're letting them create. Got it, man. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much, Abhijit, and thank you so much, John. I think uh, we will wind up right now. So, uh, sorry. Uh, so, for the closing, I'd just like to recap a few quotes that I found very interesting from your presentation. So, uh, palliative care for children no longer means to die well. It means helping children to live well and then when the time is certain to help them to die gently. Mm -hmm. The next one is don't interpret, ask for the meaning to the children itself. Mm -hmm. Providing children with the simple miracle of an ordinary life, uh, children need to be accompanied to face the overwhelming impact of loss. What we have to do is provide the quiet miracle of a normal life. With this, I'd like to wind up. Joan, thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for your time. It was a great session. You gave us all an insight about how to deal with children in palliative care. And uh, thank you so much to all of you for being patient. And um, I hope you have learned a lot of things from this session. Thank you once again. And thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, everybody. It was wonderful being with you. And enjoy the whole training. Um, it's a wonderful training. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Joan. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Uh, I have shared the feedback link. Uh, kindly go through it and fill it up. Mm -hmm. Bye. We'll see you on the next class. Thank you, Mamanya, so much for your wonderful session. Bye. Bye.